Amen. Well, thank you, worship team. And uh, I want to invite you to turn within your Bibles to Psalm 3. And if you've been tracking with us, you're probably wondering why you're not turning to Acts chapter 2. It, we're going to take a little break from our series through the book of Acts. Uh, over the course of the summer, we're going to spend our time in the Psalms. And perhaps that seems weird to you. Uh, a pastor friend who I really respect, uh, as he was looking at the sermon, he said, you're not even through the second chapter of Acts and you're pausing your series. That's weird. Um, and then I realized, that is weird, isn't it? So, apologize for that. But I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, the reason is, we're going to be doing a few pulpit swaps over the next few weeks. Um, so, for example, next Sunday, Pastor Jody Cross is going to be here, and I'm going to be going down to minister at his congregation. And uh, then in a few weeks, I think about three or four weeks, uh, we're going to be doing a pulpit swap with Emmanuel Aurelia, and Pastor Dave Whitelaw will be here, and I'll be there. And then in September, Pastor Paul is going to be here, and I'll be at Cornerstone. Uh, we just wanted to take this opportunity to to strengthen some of the bonds that we have with our brothers and sisters across the city. And it didn't feel fair to have them jump in midstream to our Acts series. So they're going to be coming in and preaching on the Psalms. And so that's why we're here. I hope you have your Bible open to Psalm chapter 3. And at this time, I know we got a lot of visitors, so this, this is probably one of the weirder things we'll do today. Um, but we just, we take a, a moment of silence before we, we jump into the text. Um, and we just invite the Lord to speak to us. So at this point, we're just going to take a minute of silence and then I'll pray for us and we'll jump in. Gracious God, we ask for your help today, and I thank you for an opportunity in a world that is moving very fast uh, to be still. And Lord, I, I can feel it in myself, I can hear it in my voice, just running a mile a minute already, and it's good for us to be slow. Lord, we acknowledge that, humanly speaking, there are so many reasons why we shouldn't hear from you today. Uh, Lord, there are distractions all around us. Lord, this is a warm room. Uh, Lord, perhaps some people here today are feeling, feeling really muggy. Lord, I know there are volunteers here today who are exhausted and, and people who maybe have had a, a long week of work. Lord, maybe there are relational challenges and, and there's tensions that are underneath that nobody else sees but that are causing real distraction for others today. Uh, Lord, we just surrender all of that to you. You're bigger than our distractions. We ask that by the power of your spirit, you would overcome them. I pray that you would prepare us now to hear from you. Lord, would you soften our hearts and open our eyes and unstop our ears? Um, we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. Lord, we thank you that though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our God will stand forever. And we thank you for your promise that as your word goes forth, it never returns void. So we're coming with expectation today, um, Lord, and we're coming with need. Uh, we need to hear from you. And we expect to hear from you. And we thank you that we can now hear from you. So God, help. We ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, well, we're in Psalm 3. And uh, as we move into Psalm 3 and we move out of Acts, you're going to notice, you know this already, I'm sure, but Acts is a narrative. It's a story. It's walking through the events of, of what has happened in the early church. Whereas as we move into the Psalms, this is poetry. Uh, more than that, this is poetry that is to be sung. This was the, the hymn book of the early church. And we approach songs differently than we approach stories. And one of the things that we want to add to our approach as we learn to be better Bible readers is we want to understand the context in which these songs were written because context matters. So for example, we just finished singing the song, It Is Well With My Soul. I wonder, just raise your hand if you know the backstory of, of that song. I know this, it's a well-known story, but some of you don't. And yet, whether you knew the backstory or not, it's a beautiful song, isn't it? It's a powerful song. But when you know the story that, that led to that song being written, it's, it's filled with, with new meaning. So it was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. Uh, he was a lawyer by trade. He had a beautiful family, a wife, uh, a daughter, and four sons. No, a, a wife, a son, and four daughters. And uh, he was very wealthy. He invested the family's wealth into real estate in Chicago, where they were living. Uh, but then tragedy struck this beautiful family, and uh, his son passed away. While the family was still grieving the loss of their son, there was a, a large fire in Chicago, and actually the fire hit the city in a place where all of his real estate was situated. And so overnight, he lost all of his investment. And so a life of saving and work was gone. Their son was gone, and this family was reeling. But they had a friend who was a minister, who you might have heard of, uh, D.L. Moody, a famous pastor. And 
knowing that they were in a bit of a crisis, he invited them to join him as he was preaching across the Atlantic. I think he was preaching in Great Britain. And the family decided that a rest would be helpful. They just needed to get away from all that had taken place. And so they booked their tickets and they were going to board a ship and and cross the Atlantic. But there was some unexpected business that arose and Horatio needed to stay back. And he sent his wife and his four daughters on this ship And as they were crossing the Atlantic, they struck another English vessel, and their ship sank. There was a rescue crew involved, but it it was pretty tragic. They say that the ship sank within a matter of 12 minutes. It was, I don't know how quickly ships normally sink, but he received a message from Wales, and the message was from his wife, praise the Lord, and the message said, saved alone. So his four daughters perished. And he boarded a ship, and he went to be with his grieving wife. And it was on that ship, and it was allegedly as he was coming to the place where the other ship had sank, that he sat down and he wrote these words, these words that we just sang, these powerful words in and of themselves, but there's a whole other meaning that comes into them when we hear the story. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. And you can see the context matters. And the shape of that song is dictated by the story. And in the same way, here in Psalm 3, we're meant to understand the story. I know that we are because right above verse 1, we see this superscription. And the superscription says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. And so if you've ever been with us, you know that on a typical Sunday, we read the text, then we explain the text, and then we apply the text. Well, this morning, I'm going to shift that order. I actually want to spend some time off the front, off the top, explaining the text, because understanding the story is going to shape the way that we read the text and the way that we hear it. So the psalmist wants us to hear, before we read verse 1, he wants us to hear that this was written as David was fleeing from, not not just some enemy, Right? Not just some king trying to take over the city. No, as he was fleeing from his son, Absalom. We need to understand that if we're going to hear this as we should. The details of the backstory are captured in the book of 2 Samuel. So, for example, if you were to, if you were to flip to chapter 15, and you can do this perhaps as you go home today for some homework, you can hear the story of, of what took place. But because of David's sin, there was a history of division and tension and unhealth in the royal family. And in particular, there was an episode in which David's daughter, Tamar, was, she was raped by her brother Amnon. And this was brought to King David's attention, but he didn't deal with it. He neglected it. He, he sinned. He, he neglected this responsibility. And this infuriated Absalom, and it put into motion what we're going to find in our text today. Absalom took it upon himself to remove David from his kingship. And there we learn that David is is not an innocent sufferer as he writes this psalm. Absalom is now, he's taken justice upon himself. He's going to make his father pay. And so what he did was he stationed himself at the entrance to the city. And as people would come into the city, he fed them lies about David. And slowly and surely, he turned the hearts of the people against the king. And his plan worked. In 2 Samuel 15, 13, we're told, a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise, let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. And so if you could just picture the scene, this is the height of humility. King David gets up from his throne and grabs his attendants, and he hightails and runs out of his own capital city. And as he's running in this direction, uh, coming into the city from the other direction is his beloved son. And we, we learn in the text both before and after that David loved Absalom. This wasn't his enemy in his mind. This was his son whom he loved. And, but Dave, Absalom comes in the city to murder his father. And as Absalom comes into the city, he's greeted by cheers and applause. The covenant community, the people that David had been leading and directing, the people that he had fought for, that he had bled for, these people who who had been following for all these years are now clapping and applauding as his son chases him out of the city. Needless to say, David is devastated. 
In verse 30 of 2 Samuel 15, it says, David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot, with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And so that's the scene. David weeping, fleeing from his son. All that he has has been stripped from him. It's betrayal at the deepest level. And he sits down and he writes Psalm 3. So how does a person pray when the world has been turned upside down? How does a person sing when their closest loved ones have actually dealt them their deepest wounds? How does a person worship in times of trouble? Far too many of us find that our prayer life is dictated, for better or for worse, by our circumstances. Right? Whether, you know, when we're up high, when we're down low, we see that the way that we approach God, the way that we come to God, changes as we change. And that's very dangerous because we change all the time, don't we? All the time we're changing. So for far too many of us, we, we haven't learned how to pray from the depths. And so when we're plunged into the depths, we hide from God. Far too many of us have never learned the discipline, and it is a discipline, of praying through tears in faith. So when we feel angry and we feel betrayed and we feel disillusioned and we feel frightened, we're not entirely sure what to do with those feelings. And so today we come back to what is our theme verse for this year, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray when the sun is shining, but also, Lord, teach us to pray when there's an enemy at the gate. Teach us to pray when when those closest to us have betrayed us and when all we can see is failure and defeat. This psalm was written to instruct us. It's a psalm for times of trouble. So would you look with me now to Psalm 3. Hear now God's holy, inspired, inerrant, living and active word to us today. O Lord, how many are my foes Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory, the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Selah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Psalm 3 is a psalm of lament. And uh, we had a whole series through the psalms of lament. So if if you've been tracking with us, you're familiar. The psalms of lament express the cries of our heart, the cries of desperation. And yet this psalm of lament seems to have a a tone that that takes over after the first four verses. And it's a tone of confidence, isn't it? You can hear it. David very quickly shifts to confidence. Verse 5, I think, is one of the most beautiful verses in all the psalms. And so if you're here today and you have an anxious heart, maybe you really struggle with anxiety, boy, verse 5 is one that you might consider committing to memory. David says, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. David's been driven from his throne. He's surrounded by his enemies. He's been betrayed by his own beloved son. And he says, yet I lay down and I slept. How does he do that? How does he sleep when anyone else would be tossing and turning? Well, this psalm answers that question for us. So what we're going to do, I I mentioned, we've already explained the backstory of this text. It's not particularly complicated, this passage. The challenging part for us today, having explained it, now having read it, the challenging part is applying this text. And so that's what we're going to do with the rest of our time. We're going to ask a very practical question. How to be quiet in times of trouble? How do we do it? First, in times of trouble, take it to the Lord in prayer. Boy, and it sounds so simple, doesn't it? And yet it it never feels quite this simple. David masterfully does this. In verses 1 to 2, he says, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him 
in God. And I want you to notice that David doesn't tiptoe around his problems. Neither should we. He's bold with the Lord. He's specific. He doesn't hold back. One commentator, Alec Machir, notes that David is too practical to say, forget your problems. By the way, hear that. That is not the counsel of Scripture. The Bible never says, forget your problems. Oh, he's too practical for that. No, don't try to forget them, but rather face and describe them as these Psalms do. Face it head on and tell the Lord. You point at it and let Him know. Is your marriage on the brink of collapse? You point at Him and you tell the Lord. Are you concerned as you watch your child wandering off the rails? You tell it to the Lord. You're not sure how you're going to provide for your family. You, you see that there's a looming job loss and now you're looking at inflation and the culture. You, lay that down. You tell it to the Lord. You're angry about the way your life has turned out. Frightened about the future. Whatever your problem is, as a, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, you don't need to conceal this from him. You don't need to pretend that it's nothing. And more importantly, you don't need to try and handle it on your own. One commentator notes, I think this is very helpful, too often plans come before prayers. Isn't that the truth? Too often when our world gets turned upside down, rather than doing what David does here and bringing our concerns to the Lord, we bring our concerns to the drawing board. And we try to figure out, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow and next month and next year? And we, we allow our minds to go all the way over here. And eventually, of course, we need to do that. Eventually, we do need to step in and, and put together a plan. But what we learn here in Scripture, the consistent testimony, is that before we put our plans in motion, we need to bring these things to the Lord. Because can I tell you something? He's better equipped to handle this than you are. Can I tell you something else? He, he invites you to bring your burdens to Him. He delights when we bring our concerns to Him. In 2 Peter, we're told, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. How do you humble yourself? What does that practically look like? Casting all your anxieties on Him. Because He cares for you. See, David wrote Psalm 3 a thousand years before 2 Peter was ever written. But David already had this down. In our psalm this morning, David is humbling himself by casting all of his anxieties, all of his concerns on the Lord. And he's doing this with an awareness that his God cares for him. Oh, that we would believe this. That God loves us. I had the privilege of teaching Psalm 23 to the kids at camp this week. And it was... Chaotic at times, but it was, it was sweet all the time. I got to look these kids in the eyes. I got to tell them that the Lord is their shepherd. I got to tell them that, that our God is, is the provider. I got to tell them that our God is, is with us when we're in the, the green pastures and we're beside still waters. He's also the God who's with us when we're in the valley of the shadow of death. I got to tell them that even when we're surrounded, even when we're in the presence of our enemies, he makes a table for us. He blesses us, anoints us with oil. And I, I counted it a great privilege to let these kids know in a frightening world that they are not alone. And I counted an equally great privilege to be able to share that same truth with you today. You are not alone. And maybe you're here today and you just feel overwhelmed by the crises in your life. And maybe you're here today and you just feel isolated with the battles that you're facing. And I want you to hear today from the, from the Word of God that you are not alone. The Lord is our shepherd. And He is with us. And He does invite us to bring our concerns to Him. So lay them down at His feet. Every last one of them. Be bold like David. Be specific. Be thorough. And take them to the Lord. That's the first lesson that we learn in this song. Oh, that the Lord would help us to apply this truth. Second, if you want to learn how to be quiet in times of trouble, then you need to remember who your God is. Remember who your God is. Now David to be frank, had uh, a number of problems. Uh, David fell short in so many ways, and yet we could all agree that if there's one area where David was strong, it is this area. Boy, David knew who his God is. Always. He knew that he served a, a great, powerful, mighty God. This is uh, the same David who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath. 
right? And he wasn't afraid to go before this giant because he knew who his God was. And now here he is, and he's surrounded by a multitude of enemies. These enemies actually are his former friends, and yet David looks to the same God who gave him boldness to face the giant. And he prays in verses 3 to 4, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. See, David's just been chased out of the city, hiding from his own son. An attack is imminent, and it will be nothing short of a miracle if David survives this next wave. Yet he knows who his God is. He remembers where his help comes from, and therefore this prayer, as we've noted, is marked by a decided confidence. And I mentioned it's not complicated, and so he uses analogies that we can readily understand. He says, you're a shield, Right, and we, we can un, you can picture a shield. Only David says, it's not like any shield though, because this shield protects me on this front, but the Lord is a shield that protects me on every front. You're all around me, meaning none of the arrows of the enemy can hit me unless you allow them, Lord. And I don't need to fight. I don't need to clamor for my position, for my glory, because you, God, are my glory. And I've been pushed out of the kingdom, but I don't need to wrestle the kingdom back for myself because you, Lord, are the lifter of my head. David, he sees his God and he says, I've got problems all around me, but I see you and I know that these things are true about you. Willem van Gemmeren notes here, the confidence of the king was not in his knowledge of the future, nor in the might of his forces, but in God who had installed him as king. I could just pause there. How often is our confidence in our perceived knowledge of the future? How often do we place our confidence in the plans that we've laid ahead? Even though, boy, haven't we learned in the last little while that who of us can say what will happen tomorrow or next week, let alone five years? How often is, is our plan, in our confidence, in our might, in our power, in how much money is in the bank account? And how quickly that confidence can be undermined? But that wasn't the case for David. David. Even as he was king, even as he had an army at his disposal, throughout, David's confidence was always founded in his God. Therefore, when his circumstances changed, his confidence didn't change. So maybe if if we're here today and our confidence fluctuates as our circumstances fluctuate, perhaps our confidence is in the wrong place. A.W. Tozer was right when he wrote, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God? Who, who is the God that you serve, that you look to? We, um, on our Thursday nights, I mentioned we've got our prayer breakout group in here, and we've been just working through the Lord's Prayer. How did Jesus teach us to pray? And in the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, we made note of the fact that, that He begins that prayer not with our circumstances, but with an awareness of who our God is. What's the first petition? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So Jesus says, as you come in prayer, the first thing that you need to do is you need to remember who your God is. So here's a question. What comes into your mind when you think of God? Is he a God who cares? Or is he distant and disinterested? Because the Lord Jesus said, he's your Father. He's your Father. Not disinterested. right? Not not aloof. He cares for you. Or what comes into your mind when you think about God? Is is he a powerless God? Is he a God who's left wringing his hands and he's watching your circumstances and trying to make a plan of how can I try to sort all this out? Or is is he a God who's in control? Jesus says, our Father who art in heaven, who art Lord over our problems, who is holy, 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 who is not phased by our circumstances, who in fact is Lord over them. Can you, can you declare with the Apostle Paul, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You can only pray that if you believe that your God is a Father who is in heaven. Your God is a God who cares and who is powerful to act. Listen, the God of the Bible, if we're dealing frankly and honestly with what we see in the text, the God of the Bible is a big and glorious God. He's an in control of every detail God. He's a nothing slips by me God. This is the God that David prays to, and this is why he can pray this way as he's driven out of his city and hiding from his son. 
Because even though he's in the worst circumstances possible, God is still the same, and God is not surprised. One of my favorite quotes of all time says, anxiety is a heart confessing that Christ is not Lord. Right? So when we feel those, those feelings, and I confess that I, this is a particular sin that is a battle in my life, and I've, I've had big struggles with this, that sometimes I'm, I'm not so much like David. Sometimes I'm lying in my bed at night, and I'm preaching this sermon to myself, and, and over and over and over, and trying to remind myself that he's in control. But that anxiety creeps in, and what's happening in that moment is my heart is confessing that I don't believe that Christ is Lord. I don't necessarily believe that he's got this. And so I think I've got to have this, and I think I've got to make the plans, and I've got to rope all this down, and I can't sleep because, you know what, I actually don't have all of this, and I can't rope all of this down because I'm just a man. I'm just, I'm just a small man in this world, and it's spiraling all around about me, and David was just a man too. But David saw that while I'm just, I'm just a man, he's God, and he has it. And when we can see God rightly, by the grace of God, when our eyes are open to behold our God, everything changes. And we can rest in him. We'll never be quiet in times of trouble until we remember who our God is. But we can't stop there. There's one final lesson that we need to learn from this passage. And it's the most important lesson in this psalm. If you would be quiet in times of trouble, then you need to trust in the plans and promises of God. And this right here is the the most important piece Because, in fact, everything else that we've said thus far is inapplicable and void of comfort apart from the promises of God. Right? You can take your burdens to the Lord all you want, but if you don't believe that He cares, if you don't believe that He he acts, then what is that? That's that's self-talk. Or, you know, if you remember who God is and you see Him as this, you know, this powerful, mighty God, but you don't believe that He's for you and there's no promise that He is for you, well, then that's no comfort at all either, is it? Yet in this psalm, David clearly believes that God will answer his prayer and he clearly believes that God is for him. And that is mysterious and miraculous because when we look back at the larger story, we see that, boy, Humanly speaking, David shouldn't have such a a great confidence. What right did David have to expect blessing on his life? Where did his confidence come from? Did it come from his own righteousness? It couldn't have. As we mentioned, David was not blameless, not by any stretch of the imagination. That's the whole reason why Absalom has started this mutiny. I mean, as David is running, David is realizing that I've brought this upon myself with my sin. David was a horrifically negligent father. David was a hypocrite. And that's just in his recent past. But if we look back further and we think of what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah, David used his position of power to essentially rape a woman. Then he used his position of power to murder a man. David is a sinner through and through. And yet, God had made a promise to David. And so David in this psalm is showing that he believes that the promise of God is stronger than anything. The promise of God is stronger than Absalom. And the the promise of God is actually stronger than the many thousands who are opposed against him. And here's the thing that David's seeing at at the bottom of it all. The promise of God is even stronger than David's egregious sin. Do you believe that this morning? That the promise of God is stronger than your sin? If you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, God has made some glorious promises to you. Can I, can I tell you one? One promise that, that can hold us, that can be an anchor for us in any storm? Here's a promise for us. Christian, Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will be safe. You know how this story ends, regardless of the details, regardless of the circumstances in the here and now. You've got an eternal perspective, right? You are bound for glory as we've been singing. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, it's nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. You know all of this. 
And there's nothing that can touch that promise. If you believe that Jesus lived for you, that He died for you, that He rose for you, that He now sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, you will be saved. What have you to fear? The problem is, there's an adversary. And the devil's going to play the part of Absalom. He's going to try to convince you that actually your sin has negated the promise. He's going to take hold of all your very real faults and failures and shortcomings and sin. That's what they are. He's going to take hold of those and they're very real and he's going to wave them in your face. And he's going to say, how could the promises of God hold true for a person like you? He's the accuser. That's what the Bible says. That's who he is. And he's good at what he does. Sinclair Ferguson notes, speaking of the devil, he knows that he cannot destroy the salvation of God's people. Oh, but he is bent, indeed hell-bent, as he was in Eden, on destroying our peace, liberty, and joy in God. And so that is what he will do. And he is good at what he does. But our God is a promise keeper. And can I tell you something? He is better at what he does. And he declares, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So as the accuser whispers, our God declares with authority that our, the promises of God are stronger than our sin. That the blood of Jesus Christ is stronger than our sin. That the comfort of the Holy Spirit is stronger than our sin. And so, Christians, even as we find ourselves in times of trouble, the kinds of trouble that leave you buried in fear and anxiety, we can declare along with David... I'm going to read from verse 5 to the end. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who've set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all the enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. If David could pray this way before Jesus came, if David could believe the promise that there was salvation even for sinners like him before seeing Christ on the cross, then how much more can we have this confidence, brothers and sisters? It's ours in Christ. Salvation does belong to the Lord. We've seen it. He walked out of the tomb. He says that we were buried with Him. We have been raised with Him. If we have confessed our sin and turned away, if we've placed our trust in Jesus Christ, Salvation is ours. And that's how the miracle of verse 5 is possible. How do we lay down and sleep while the accuser is whispering in your ears and he's holding up very real evidence that ought to leave us condemned and ought to leave us stirring in our bed? How do we do it? Because salvation belongs to the Lord and salvation is ours in Jesus Christ. How do we have any comfort at all when we feel as if we are surrounded by a multitude of enemies? Well, we have confidence because salvation belongs to the Lord and that salvation is ours in Jesus Christ. God has broken the teeth of the accuser. Maybe you read that the first time. This might be the only piece that feels slightly vague to us. You wonder this striking on the cheek and the breaking of teeth. But you remember, David was a shepherd, shepherd boy. That's where he came up from. And all of his enemies were bears and wolves and lions. And, and once you take away the teeth, like that's, the weapon is gone. David is saying, God, you're the one who disarms my enemy. And our God has disarmed our enemy. He's disarmed the accuser. The only weapon that the devil can wield against us is our sin. And yet, what has God done with our sin? Colossians 2, 14, 15 says this, our sin, he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus, in Him. So our adversary's been disarmed. He's a toothless enemy. Did you know that? He's all bark and no bite. That's what the Bible says about the devil. All he can do is lie to you. And the lie that he's going to wield against you, more often than not, is the lie that the promise of God is no match for your sin. But don't believe him for a second. Because that's a lie. John Newton was a man who knew about sin, 
Um, he wrote Amazing Grace. I suspect you've heard it, even if you're a guest today. The man who wrote, who wrote Amazing Grace was formerly a, a slave trader and uh, heavily involved in the slave trade. And it was a wickable, deplorable thing. And when he, when he became a Christian, the Lord slowly changed his heart and he was caused to see the wickedness of it all. And when he was nearing the end of his life, he has this great quote. He said, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great savior. Sometimes it strikes me that if we knew, if we knew the deepest, darkest things of the people sitting next to us and in front of us and behind us today, we'd be shaken, wouldn't we? And you know what's more shaking? If, if they knew the deepest, darkest things about the person sitting next to them, you. Boy, what a devastating thing. And yet here we are, sinners who, who time and time again fall short of the glory of God. Here we are brought together on a level playing field, and it was made possible by Jesus Christ. And the accuser hates it. And the accuser is going to try to twist and distort our minds. And he's going to try to make us flee from one another. But most dangerously, he's going to try to make us flee from our God. And when he does, we can turn in our Bibles to Psalm 3. And we can learn from David. David, who didn't have the benefit of, of Christ on the cross. David hadn't seen this yet. And yet David saw his great God and he knew, no, no, no. I can have confidence even in times of trouble. In times of trouble, when you feel as if you are absolutely overwhelmed, you can take it to the Lord. Remember who your God is. Trust in His plans and promises for you. And then, having done that, by the grace of God, lie down and sleep like a baby. That's what we can do in Christ. This is the confidence we have in Christ. This is our prayer in times of trouble. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we come to you today because we can. We come to you today because we need you. We don't come to you today because of our righteousness. Because Lord, in and of ourselves, what do we have? Lord, like David, we all sin. Your word says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You are holy, holy, holy. There's no reason why we should be able to come before you except that you so love the world that you sent your son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have life everlasting. And so we believe, God help our unbelief, we believe that Jesus Christ came and he died for us and he took our sin and he removed it from us and now we're coming to you, God, cleansed and renewed and we're, we're coming before your throne with confidence, not in ourselves but in your son, Jesus Christ. God, would you help us? Help us to be a people that turn to you again and again and again. Lord, forgive us for all the times that we have been deceived by the evil one. Forgive us for the times when we have believed his lies, Lord, and we've, we've hid from you. And Lord, I, I want to pray for those right now who are even further deceived by the evil one, whose minds have been darkened, whose eyes have been closed to the glory of the gospel. And they're bearing their guilt and they're bearing their shame. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help them to see right now that if they confess their sins and believe in their heart, if they look to Christ, they can be saved today. God, I just pray that you would do what only you can do. Oh, so we ask for your help. Lord, and there's not, there's not a person here who doesn't need to be reminded of this gospel truth, myself included. Lord, the Apostle Paul identified himself as chief of sinners, Lord, and, and, and boy, that, that fits like a glove sometimes. Uh, Lord, we fall short, and yet you are so gracious and kind. So, Lord, I pray for those who are in troubled times right now. And, Lord, and I know of some of the troubles even in this room, uh, troubles that are absolutely overwhelming, dark pits where it feels like there's not even a glimmer of light. There's not a glimmer of hope. And yet, God, I pray that rather than looking for the glimmer, we would look to you, that we would behold our God. In Christ alone, our hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Help us to sing. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Worship team, would you lead us?